thank you for greeting each other. I, uh, I'm excited about this time of year, not least which is because of Thanksgiving and Christmas, but perhaps I'm most excited about the fact that the college basketball season has officially started, and my Tar Heels are in their championship defending year. There's a bunch of players I'm going to get to know, hopefully over the next few years, since a lot of guys left, and I'm excited. I was going to wear my Carolina watch that someone gave me years ago, but the battery's dead, and I can't figure out how to open it. So next week, though, I promise I'll have it on. I have, a, I have two watches that I've had for years and years, and that was one of them. And this one my wife's family gave me when we got married. You don't need to know that at all. I, <laughs> This is the benefit of a slightly smaller congregation is you get to learn about the pastor's watch. There you go. So <laughs> this morning, we are continuing our sermon series on Ecclesiastes. And change the title of the series now to Life Matters. I, I like that title. I like it because it affirms the fact that our life matters, but it also is dealing with some of the matters of our lives. And this section of Ecclesiastes, over the next few weeks as we look at it, sort of focuses on, our, our teacher uh, focuses us on several uh, issues that sort of impact our daily lives, our, our weekly routines, the things that really matter for how we make decisions and the, the stuff we do on, on a regular basis. And so last week we looked at uh, worship, and we saw that we are to worship reverently uh, as we come together uh, 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 to worship God. And this morning we're going to look at the issue of money once again. Now, our teacher has talked about this topic before, uh, but here he really goes into how money uh, fails spectacularly to give us meaning and purpose in life. And instead, he is going to point us once again to the way that we can find true meaning and purpose in this world. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes 5 in the Pew Bible, the red book in front of you is page 474. We're going to start in verses 8 and 9 of Ecclesiastes 5, and the teacher begins by sort of talking about the big picture issues, and he wants to lay out for us that the love of money leads to significant corruption in the governments and the institutions of humanity. And so he starts and he says, if you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Uh, our teacher uh, reminds us of what we're often aware of, sadly, and that is that money corrupts our governments. And he says that don't be surprised by that if you see the oppression of the poor, because in a sense he's saying that should be obvious, that, that, that people love money, they pursue money, and those who gain power often use their power to enrich themselves, and, and societies and governments often run upon uh, taking advantage or seeking to take advantage of those who are poor or who can be taken advantage of. Now, we're not going to go into that much this morning. As we continue through Ecclesiastes, he talks more about government and and maybe we'll tackle the issue of oppression a bit more then. But I want to just bring that in because he's showing us sort of on a big level the reality of corruption. And often we look at that in government and we say, what a shame and how terrible that is. And then the teacher's going to bring this right down into our own lives to say, that may be true up there, but how does it get that way? It gets that way because each and every one of us is tempted to love money. And because of our love of money, we might follow that love, and that might lead us to places that are very destructive to our lives and to our cultures as a whole. And I guess maybe it doesn't need to be reminded, but I will remind us that it's easy sometimes to read through these texts as Christians in America and to, to maybe think of those who are super wealthy in our culture. And it's easy to sort of deflect this stuff away from ourselves, but let me challenge you to really take to heart the reality that we are the richest people in the world. Our society puts all the rest of the kingdoms of the world to shame as far as wealth. And so it's easy, and, and if I'm honest with you, which I try to be most times, I want to sort of deflect this off into the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs and the Warren Buffetts and the super rich and say, well, this is their problem. But when I open God's word, it's staring right at me and saying, Charles, you might want to consider this might be your problem. This might be our problem. It's very easy to make money something that we really believe will give us purpose and meaning and gain in this world. 
And so with that thought in mind, let's, unpleasant thought, Matt, admittedly, in mind, let us look into now what he talks about money and what he warns us about money. And he starts off in verse 10 of chapter 5, focusing us on the reality that money can cause great trouble in our lives, not just in society as a whole, but within our individual homes, our individual families. And he's going to lay out for us why this is the case. And his basic principle is this, is that money never satisfies. We think it will, but it never does. And so he starts off in verse 10 saying, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Again, this word futile, fruitless, it doesn't give us any gain. And I'm pretty sure that we can all in this room identify with this pitfall of money, that we're always wanting and planning for and needing more money. And it's difficult to be satisfied with what we have. And as I think about why is it that money is insatiable in our lives, why do we need more of it, is I think one reason is we have made money a sign of success in our lives. Uh, we want and we expect that if we do our jobs well, what's going to happen at the end of the year review? Thanks for working hard. You've done great. Now here's an income raise. If we don't get that, sometimes we walk away from there going, what? Why doesn't the company like me? What have I done wrong? We have equated good work with financial compensation. We look at the wealthy and we believe then because of that, that if you make that much money, you must be a super great person or worker or accomplished individual. And we look at the poor conversely and we say, what happened to them? Why are they such losers? that they can't rise to the rest of the levels. You see, we have equated success with wealth and income, and the truth is, the teacher says to us, is listen, if you make that equation, you're never going to have enough because you have wrapped up your identity in your income, and your identity is always searching for validation and affirmation, and it will never come from the money that you get. And the other problem with money is, is that we really do believe that it will give us meaning and purpose. We really do believe that it's going to take care of us and it will provide for us. We give it the place of God in our lives and it seems like a reasonable idol to have because we look around and we say, boy, it sure seems like those who have the most money get the best health care and those who have the most money get the best places to live and the best cars and the best vacations and maybe the best families and all of this. And so we say that really will be the thing that provides for us on earth. And so it's such a powerful temptation. And the teacher lays out for us and he says, listen, if you say this will give you meaning and purpose and safety and protection, you will never find enough of it in your life to do that. He goes on to say in verse 11, money never satisfies, never satisfies because we spend what we get. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The teacher gives us a picture of a man here who sees his financial opportunity expand but so do, does, too, the demand on the money that he makes, right? So he, let's say he's a farmer, right? He's got money, and he's got great crops, and so he can buy more fields and more lands. Well, if you get more fields and more lands, what does that mean? You've got to get more workers to work the fields and the lands. And there's always this point where you start to realize, boy, I'm making 10 times as much as I did before, and 10 times as much is going out to pay for the 10 times more that I have granted. Look what he says. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And then if he adds to his family and he adds to his workers, all of a sudden you've got more and more that you've got to spend in order to keep the life that you want. And the truth is we experience this in our own lives too. How many of us looking back, I mean, I do this every time I do my finances, right? I look back and go, how do I have so much money now? And I still have no money. I remember when I first was married and I was a single guy, I made like really a much less than I did. And I still had food and a car and a place to live, right? And now I make a whole lot more and I still have food and a car and a place to live and a family. But the problem I think has become everything I do now is a lot more expensive than it was then because I've got more I can spend, right? So why buy the really cheap stuff when you can get maybe the more moderately priced stuff or even sometimes the high end stuff, right? All of a sudden we see we have less and less because we're spending more. It just comes and it just goes. And, and sometimes I wish I looked back and said, boy, if I had been more conservative and constricting on my life back then, where would I be now? And instead I'm where I'm now and I'm going, I need more for tomorrow. According to an article, and this is sad, 
according to an article on CNBC Money, no matter how much you earn, getting by is still a struggle for most people in our culture. 78% of full-time workers said they live paycheck to paycheck. And that's according to a recent career builder survey. It says overall, 71% of all US workers said they're now in debt, up from 68% a year ago. About 56% also save $100 or less each month. And while household income has grown over the past decade, it has failed to keep up with the increased cost of living over the same period. Even those making over six figures, so that's 100,000 or more, said they struggle to make ends meet. Nearly one in 10 of those making 100,000 or more said they usually or always live paycheck to paycheck. And 59% of those in that salary range say they were in red. So if we take this reality of that we are the wealthiest people the world has ever known, and a huge percentage of us, 78% of us, are living paycheck to paycheck and have very little savings and have very little and are in debt significantly. The wisdom from, what, 3,000 years ago holds true. The more we get, the more we spend. Money will never satisfy. He goes on to say, money never satisfies because it increases worries and problems. According to Ecclesiastes 5.12, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man him, permits him no sleep. Now, the teacher here is making sort of a general proverbial statement. Clearly, we realize sometimes people in poverty don't sleep real well, and those who labor sometimes don't have great sleep either. But he's trying to make the point that says, honest work lived within means allows you to truly rest. But if you're rich, he's saying, listen, the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. He points out that, that while we often think the rich have an easy life, the truth may be that they're very anxious and they're very stressed. Why? Because maybe they're anxious and stressed because they have more money. Uh, they need more and more. They're spending more and more, as we saw on that last point. Maybe they're anxious and stressed because they're worried about the income they have and protecting the money that they have. And he says, listen, the guy, though, that works, who works hard, is a manual labor, perhaps, or other honest work, he comes home to where his needs are provided for and he sleeps well at life. The stress and anxiety of the wealthy and the rich are not his problem. Uh, I was talking with a gentleman who's a senior uh, who's getting remarried after his wife had passed away. And he was asking for a prayer request because he says, you know, when I was first married to his first wife, who he was married to for quite a few years, he says they had a place they rented and maybe a car. They had nothing, no assets, nothing to speak of. And they got married and it was no big deal. Now he's marrying the lady. They said between the two of them, they have four houses. <laughs> They have significant income savings and assets. They have multiple, like 20-some grandchildren and nine children between the two of them. And he was saying, will you pray for me as we get married in a few months and we're meeting with an attorney to sort of figure out how do we rightfully protect and pass on our inheritance and our legacies to our children and those things. And, and I've heard this story over and over that, that folks that are older, that have assets, that have income, that have stuff they have to deal with, when they do marry, and rightfully so, they have to be concerned. It's not quite as simple, right, when you're 20, 21 years old and you're getting married with nothing in the world. World, it's easy to build that life together. And, but once you've lived that life a while and you have all this stuff, how do you manage that? And he was saying, pray for me and my wife-to-be that we'll make those decisions wisely. And I thought, that's not a concern I ever would have thought about. But here's a gentleman, obviously, that has been blessed financially uh, or has achieved financially in that way. And now he's got to handle that in a way that I never would have crossed my mind. Stress and anxiety of the rich, right? A practical example of that. Solomon, or the teacher says, listen, <laughs> the abundance of a rich man, the anxiety, the stress levels are there, that his nights are consumed with worries. It doesn't satisfy. He goes on to say, money never satisfies because it's easily misused or lost. Ecclesiastes 5, 14, 13 and 14. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. The teacher gives us one scenario in here of, of, of that money was hoarded, right? It was kept, and so it was no good use to the owner or others that he could have blessed with his resources. And he says, this is foolish. It's worthless. It's, it's as if you have no money at all. You've not put it to good use that God has granted it to you. You've hoarded it all. I heard a story from a friend who, who, who she grew up in a household that, that was very, very frugal, even miserly, right? 
they, they, they were tight-fisted with their money. And she would say at times she felt deprived. I mean, they didn't eat, drink regular milk. They drank powdered milk. I mean, they, they, they went through, in her looking back, a pretty tough time as a family because they didn't have money. And, and growing up, she, she thought, that's fine. That was the reality of our life. I can deal with that. But now that she says she's caring for her elderly parents, she realizes they had a lot of money. Like two millions of dollars. And she looks back on her life, and she's not saying, boy, I wish I was rolling in Benz's or anything. But she's saying, she's saying here, I truly look back on my life and have had to deal with and the consequences of growing up in... in a relatively struggling household when that was absolutely not necessary. It was not needed. And she's struggling with this reality of saying, here we could have lived a different life, and yet her parents, for whatever reason, hoarded that wealth, kept that wealth, and didn't bring that wealth into their life as they could have done. And so he says, listen, the trouble with money is that sometimes it messes up our brains to such a degree that we hoard it, we keep it. This is my safety. This is what's going to keep me. Therefore, I have to keep as much as I can and never let it out. Well, that's meaningless. It's futile. It's grievous evil. And then he says there's another scenario where someone works really hard to gain all that income and then some misfortune has. A business deal goes awry and everything is lost. Uh, investments are lost in the stock market. I remember a few years back when the market crashed and how many folks who had, had invested for years and years and were banking on that in their retirement lost significant amounts of money that they had hopefully and rightfully put away to live on and, and it was gone in a matter of moments. It, I don't even know how it does. It just goes. It's not there anymore. And the teacher's warning us and he's saying, listen, if you put your trust in money, it will not satisfy because you're never sure if it's actually going to be there or not. Stuff happens in life. Tragedies happen in life. Unexpected misfortune happens, and everything you've saved and worked for can be lost and gone. And, and be careful that you don't think money will satisfy in your life, because it may not. Never, money never satisfies. Why? Because we can't take it beyond this life. Ecclesiastes 5, 15 and 17. Naked a man come from his womb, his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This too is grievous evil. A man comes and so he departs. And what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Here the teacher has cast a picture of a person who has worked hard and toiled hard to gain all that money. A grim picture, he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. His soul is tor tormented because it's never satisfied him. And then the greatest insult evolves that everything he hoped would give him meaning and purpose hasn't done it in life. The money never has satisfied, and then he dies. And to use that cliche, I've never seen a giant bag of money behind a hearse, right? You can't take it with you. All the stuff you acclaim, all the stuff you take, it just goes goes to someone else, it goes to other places, it's gone. Money doesn't satisfy because it doesn't fundamentally deal with the stuff we need dealt with. The hope and life and meaning and purpose, it cannot do it. And, and to be honest, it's a pretty convincing case and one that hits a, a home in our hearts and our minds. And my guess is that each one of us can identify with some aspect of the dissatisfaction of money that the teacher listed there. Most of us recognize the trouble that money can produce in our lives. And now the teacher is going to go on to tell us why it is that money will not satisfy us. On to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, he, he basically lays out for us a case that, listen, money and wealth cannot satisfy because God has not created it as such to find satisfaction. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. I have seen another evil lurking, excuse me, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires, but God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. 
It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? All man's efforts are for his mouth, and yet his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The teacher says that when we look at life without knowing God, right? Under the sun, remember way back when we started this, when we see this idea that under the sun, is this life without the perspective of God and his presence and his work in it. And so from that perspective, he says, it is a grievous evil. It is a heavy burden that here human beings toil away for wealth and money and power that it brings and all of that stuff, lacking nothing the heart desires, and yet they cannot enjoy it. It does not satisfy. They're always looking for a little bit more I've spent the last, I need a little bit more. My investments didn't come through. I'm losing it all. I know it's all going to go away, but I'm going to enjoy life to the fullest now. And everything they invest in and plan in is bitterness and frustration and anger. And this is life if we believe money will solve all of our problems. If we believe that money gives us meaning and purpose, and it's very difficult to accept the fact that money will not do that. And so it is a heavy burden. It weighs heavily on us, and it destroys life. He, he looks as well at how money impacts family life, and he says that it's a true shame that a person can have prosperity and wealth and many children, and we need to understand when we talk about, he'll talk about children a lot in this. We've already seen that here, that for, for the Jewish culture and their expectation, it was a goal and ambition and the desire for a Jewish man to have a son that he could pass his heritage on to. It was a sign of God's blessing, rightfully or wrongfully, in their culture, that he had a big family, lots of sons, that, that your life was going great. And here he says, here he has all of this, right? He has all these children, and there's no one there to give him a proper burial. What is that saying? Not that he didn't have kids. It's that they didn't care about him because he was a jerk. He worshipped his money. He neglected his family. He didn't do the duties that God had given him that were expected, expectations in their culture. And so when he dies, they're like, hey, good thing the old man's dead. Maybe we'll get his money now. And hopefully they won't follow that same path that he did, but they probably will. It was such an important deal to them to receive a proper burial. Remember when Joseph in Egypt, he, he, God worked and he brought his family down to Egypt. When he was on his deathbed, he said, hey, listen, when you guys go back to Israel, please take my bones with you that you might bury me in my family's tomb. And you know when they did that? 400 years later, they remembered that promise for Joseph. 400 years. That's how important that was to be honored and to shown that respect, to be buried in the family tomb. And yet the teacher is saying, here a person can have prosperity and wealth and it destroys his family. He says it's a serious matter. Consider it highly as you think about what you're pursuing and longing for in life. Money will not help you and money will destroy your relationships around you. And he says something very shocking. He says it's better to be a stillborn child. That's a harsh statement. And he's not saying belittling the grief and the sadness and the loss of a stillborn child, but he's saying, I want you to understand the emotion and the grief and the sadness we have as we think about those whose lives are lost in the womb should be carried over to how seriously we look at this matter of spending and pouring our life into money. You've ruined everything and you don't even know it. You should be grieving as much for that life as you are for the child that was lost in utero. That's a strong statement. And it's to shake our minds and help us to focus on this reality that we so easily buy into this idea that money's going to make me happy. Money's going to give me purpose. Money's going to give me safety. And we're pursuing it all along and we see evidences of it in our life that this doesn't quite satisfy and yet we keep moving forward and the teacher is laying out for us, don't be blind. Don't miss the warnings. Do you grieve for the loss of a life in the womb? Yes. Grieve for the loss of your life then because that's what you're doing. 
You're losing your life and you don't even know it. As I think about money and think about the troubles that money causes to families, if you Google anything about money and marriage, you will find that it is one of the greatest conflict things in marriages. <laughs> Some will go so far to say that it can be one of the causes of divorce. When I do premarital counseling, I use a resource, and it covers major categories of relational interaction that couples need to think about, and money is certainly on the list. Why? Because, first of all, if you get into a marriage with someone who has different views on how to handle money, it can create a ton of conflict. You marry a spender and you're a saver, get ready for some conflict. You're always going to be talking about it. You get two spenders together, I suppose you're in for problems because you're going to spend yourself into problems. You get two savers, you might run into that category I ran into earlier with the miserly family that didn't actually care for the family. Conflict is inherent in our view of money. When a spouse deceives another on how the money is spent, it can put the family into financial hardship, it can betray trusts. That if everyone thinks everything's going fine and the reality is there's dealings on the side that the spouse doesn't know about and it brings financial ruin, that's a huge betrayal of trust. When one or both spouses are workaholics to make money, they can neglect their relationship and their children and that can create all kinds of problems. When money is spent foolishly or sinfully for our pride or our pleasure, it can cause problems in our, our lives. There just are a lot of ways in which money can bring trouble to our lives. And the truth is, they're really not often are they really fundamentally about money. They're about worldview. They're about how do we view money. They're about what this teacher is warning us, that if you think money is where you're going to find safety and security and meaning, you're always going to be in conflict in that with your spouse or your children. If we believe money is our savior, then it will constantly be a source of conflict and struggle in our marriages. And so the teacher goes on to say in verse 2, he says this. Look what he says. It's interesting. He says, God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing in his heart desires. But it is God who does not enable him to enjoy them. You're like, well, that's kind of a mean thing for God to do. Why is he doing that? Because he wants us to understand that that's not where we find true life. That's a false God in our life. And so the answer comes back into Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. There's some literary reasons for that I'm not going to go into. But, but here's the point. The teacher says, listen, the answer that the teacher gives to the dissatisfaction of pursuing wealth is that we can find satisfaction in life when we reject that fruitless pursuit of wealth and instead we believe and accept that what we do and what we have is a gift from God. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart, right? I think that seldom reflects on the days of his life is that, that, that sleeplessness, that ruminating, that frustration, that dissatisfaction. He says, if you're believing that the life that God has given you is a gift from God and the resources and the finances and the money that he's given you is a gift from God, then you view it as that and you live accordingly understanding that my life is God's. All that I go through is God's. Therefore, I'm not striving and clawing and reaching for money that will not satisfy instead. And he's not saying it's bad to have money and wealth. I mean, I think we have to be careful with that in our culture because with so, so much of it. But, but he's saying, listen, God has given you possessions and, and, and houses and, and money to invest and a heritage to pass on to your children. Praise him for it and thank him for it and realize if you find enjoyment in that because you realize it comes from him, it's a gift to your life. You've got some proper perspective of what life is about. And praise God for it and thank Jesus for what he's done in your heart and your mind. That you're not like the person that's clawing and scratching and screaming and sleepless and anxious and worried all the time about money. Because it says, hey, I can trust God with what I'm going through in life. That I'm trusting him with the resources that I have. And so the way that we can really enjoy God's daily gifts is when we have confidence and trust that God is the giver of those gifts. 
And so really, gratitude is the key to a proper perspective of money and preventing it from becoming an idol in our lives. Because what does gratitude says? It means that we understand that it is a gift, that someone else has done something for us. And in this context, it's that God has blessed us with the resources of money and wealth that we have. If it comes from him, then we realize it is to be used for his purposes and plans in this world. And so it allows us to live trusting God to provide through us for our incomes and to help us appropriately gain more to take care of our families if that's necessary. We can stop foolishly and harmfully striving for more and neglecting our relationship with God and others. It allows us to find our identity, our meaning, and our purpose through our relationship with God so that we're less tempted to believe that money does that for us. And so it allows us to honestly evaluate with much less fear, right, the place of money in our lives. Because sometimes we're just not very good at it. That's complicated in our culture. But if we're loading everything up in my money, boy, it's really hard to actually be honestly say, how do I actually get myself out of debt? Or how do I actually handle these situations that I'm in? And what is the best choice? If that's everything I have my hope in, that's a very fearful proposition. But I'm trusting God to provide. I can say, hey, I screwed this up, or I didn't do this right, or, or, or I need to make changes. And I can trust that God is going to provide for me in the midst of that and make the changes necessary to understand money more properly and use its place in our lives as God has called us to. And it also enables us, and I like this, to find satisfaction in our toilsome labor under the sun, right? That we're doing our work not to gain money to give us meaning and purpose, safety, and security, but we're doing our work to honor God and use the gifts and abilities he's given us. That automatically makes our work so much more meaningful and helpful and satisfying. As we come to the end, I want to focus on what Jesus talks about this, because he has a parable. He tells a, a parable and some teaching about money that, that resonates very closely, I think, with what the teacher has told us in Ecclesiastes 5 and 6. Luke chapter 12, starting verse 15, he says this, Then Jesus said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And here's the key point. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told this, them this parable, right? The parable's point is to say your life doesn't, doesn't consist of your possessions. He says, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he says, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, and here's the key, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Right? He says, my life consists in my possessions. Look at the safety, security, meaning I have made it big time, man. Now I can sit back and enjoy the fruits of my labor. In this case, it's big barns and lots of money and parties and happiness and peace and joy. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Right? This is right out of the teacher stuff. You've done it all, and you pass away, and there's nothing for you beyond the grave. Verse 21, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you will wear, Life is more than food and the body and more than clothes. And he goes on to a pretty familiar text to many of us about how God provides for the ravens and he dresses the lilies of the field in glorious splendor and that his point is, is that God can provide for our food and our clothing and our shelter. And he concludes in verse 29, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, right? That, that's that life without God under the sun. I'm running and this will give me meaning and purpose and I'll have the barns and I'll have the food. I'll have the safety. I'll have the meaning. But look what he says, but your father knows that you need them. God's not saying, hey, go live out in the fields or sit on poles or do whatever. No, he's saying, look, I know you need food. I know you need clothes. I was there in the garden. Remember, I made the first set. I know that you need shelter. I will provide that according to my will and purposes in your life. But he says, if you trust me to provide that, then you can do verse 31. But seek his kingdom, 
and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus points out to us, he says, listen, this, old, this man's vision of the barns and the crops that are growing, he says, it's too small. It's too short. It ends at death. Instead, I want to give you a vision of life that is everlasting. And he says, this night your life is done. Don't be so short-sighted. Don't invest in the wrong thing. Don't store up treasures for yourself. Instead, be rich toward God. And, and if we think about it, what is it that prevents us from being rich towards God? Trusting in our money to keep us safe and to give us meaning and purpose, as Jesus said. A man's life does not consist of his possessions. On the flip side, what enables us to be rich toward God? Knowing that trusting God and living for him is true life. Life is more than food in the body, more than clothes, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. And then he says, listen, he gives us an example of how we can then live like that. And he says, if you really believe and trust that God has your life and you're really seeking his will, when he comes to you and he says, hey, I want you to sell everything to the poor, you're not like, no way. I can't do that. What are you talking about, God? I'm not, there's no way in the world I could do that. What would people think? Where would I find my places to live? How could that give meaning to my life? I can't watch Netflix. That one's for me, by the way. But the person that truly trusts God, if he can come and he can say those radical and frightful things to most of us who hear it, we can say, you know what? God's will be done. I trust him. My life is about living for him and I will live for him even if it's something that's really outside the norm. And then we have to ask, well, but why then exactly should I trust God? First and foremost, he created this world. He knows how best we live in it. He's the maker. We should trust him because as our creator, he promises to provide and help us in this life. And admittedly, the life is full of mess and pain and destructive temptations. And look, he proves his desire and his willingness to help us by coming into this world in Jesus. I will come and live with you. He didn't have a home. He was reliant on the gifts and donations and support of others to do his ministry on earth. He was a carpenter. He learned how to do manual labor. He slept well at night. In communion, we're going to take in a moment we remember this reality of God's love and provision and care for us is that he hasn't abandoned us. We are not alone. We're going to sing that great song at our Christmas program, and I love it. I love it mostly because it's super simple to sing. <laughs> That's not true. I love it because of the words. We are not alone. God is with us. And finally, we can trust God because he gives us eternal life. And I know and I feel the temptation that life is about the here and now. And we struggle with that all the time. But God says, listen, just like the rich man, your vision is too short. I've come to give you a kingdom of God both in this earth and that goes beyond the grave into everlasting reality. And I will remake all of this one day so that it's perfect forever and ever. Have my vision. And he proves that he's willing and capable of doing that. Why? Because he came into our world. And he came to deal with our short-sighted visions of money and our trust in money and our reliance upon it. And he says, I know your pain. I know how dissatisfying it is. And I want to free you from that. Stop running from me and run towards me. And I have come to give you life and give you life abundantly. I've come to give you hope and joy and peace and meaning and purpose in this life that lasts forever. And how did he do it? He came to die for those sins, to die for that rebellion. And he rose again to show that he can, can forgive us and to give us his righteousness that we're fully accepted by God when we trust in Christ. And so we end with this question. Are you loving God and his kingdom or do you love money and its false kingdom? 
And as we turn to communion this morning, God, Jesus asks us that we take time to thank him for the eternal life that he has given us. It is the symbol, it is the, 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 the bread that represents his body that was, that was pierced, his body that was hung upon the cross. The, 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 the juice, the wine represents the blood that flowed, the forgiveness that comes because of the shedding of his blood. And we thank him for that, that we can know God, even though we're imperfect and we struggle and we, we, we deal with these temptations and we give in more than we like. He forgives and he, he, he changes us. But he also asks us to honestly evaluate these sorts of things. And so we ask again, are you loving God and his kingdom or do you love money and its false kingdom? And if you pray about that and you ponder that question and you realize that, hey, you know what? I think I do love money in a way that I'm not supposed to. That when you were talking, that dissatisfaction of life with money resonates with me, and perhaps I've been holding out that it's going to give me meaning and purpose, and, and I want to turn from that. We have hope. Here's the hope. The first is to say, God, I'm doing that. I acknowledge that's wrong, and I want to change my heart and my attitude towards money. Please help me do that. You might need to go to other people in your life, perhaps, that have been damaged or hurt because of your love of money and confess that to them and ask for reconciliation and healing in that relationship. But God will be with you in that too and he promises to give you better life if you come out of the other end of that. The hope in this is that, listen, we're not on our own. We don't have to be banished out of the world and out of fellowship with God and his people. The hope is by confession and turning to the Lord, we're forgiven fully and completely and his help is there, both through his spirit and his word and his people to help us change and become what he wants us to be. And if you can say by God's grace that, yeah, there's, I, I love him and I'm grateful for him and I have escaped mostly the love of money in my life, praise God for that and thank him for that that you can enjoy and find satisfaction in your labor. Ask him to continue to help you to be dependent upon that because tomorrow the temptation will come again to give in to it. And pray for those of us that perhaps struggle in this area, that we would find deliverance and freedom from Christ to no longer follow these false lies of the world around us. We ask the ushers to come forward as we pray. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for the truth that you speak to us, both as you were here and told these parables and these teachings directly from your mouth, but as you inspired the teacher to write these words that we've studied and read this morning. Lord, money is a big deal for us. Every single day we think about it or use it or interact with it in our world. Every single day we're making decisions and prioritizing and having to come up with solutions. And, and Lord, that in and of itself is not evil or wrong. We realize that. But Lord, how we think about those things and handle those things very well could be. And so myself, along with my brothers and sisters here, we come before you with humble hearts, Lord, asking that you would guide us and help us in this. For those of us that have maybe traveled far down this path of, of loving money, that today would be the beginning of true change in our lives. That we would turn to you and your word and your good counselors in this world, Lord, to, to make changes. First and foremost, though, Lord, that needs to be a change of our hearts, that we would acknowledge that you alone are the Lord God that our lives are gifts from you to be used for your purposes and your glory. And that, Lord, help us to believe truly, wholly, deeply in our lives that your ways are so much better than our worlds. And that in you, we truly can find enjoyment and satisfaction in our lives, in our work, in our families, in our marriages, in how we use money in all those areas for your glory and your purposes. For those that are tempted by this, maybe because of hardships and difficulties, Lord, may your spirit strengthen them to hold firm and fast to the truth that you will provide. And Lord, may we all seek your kingdom first. And may you make that very real, we ask, in our lives. What does that actually look like on a day-to-day -day basis? How we think about and handle and deal with our money, but how we treat others, how we worship, how we do our jobs, how we interact with our neighbors and our friends and live our lives. Lord, may you be glorified. May we be drawn closer to you, our true God and Savior who loves us so much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.